Hello. Welcome to this video for Physics 131 on solving problems using simulation. So simulation is going to be a tool that we use frequently in this class to solve problems. Why? Well, many physics problems are not solvable just with algebra. Now, you might have suspected this and figured that, well, okay, maybe not with algebra, but maybe if I invoke some higher math, such as calculus, I can start to do real physics problems. Well, that helps, but even with calculus and some of the most sophisticated math that I know, you still can't solve most of the interesting real-world problems that we have. You can solve models, you can solve simplifications, but to really try and get everything, the problems are actually undoable. For example, just to make an extreme example, think about the Earth, the Sun, and the Moon. Three objects. And three objects described by a force law from the 17th century that I can write down for you that says the force of gravity between two masses, say the Earth and the Moon, the force of gravity between them is their masses and the distance between them squared. That's it. So it's a simple equation that describes the forces between these three objects. You don't need to know this equation yet. I'm just using this as an example. Simple law. Three objects. So far apart, it's perfectly reasonable to treat them as points. You cannot write down an equation that describes the motion of the sun, the earth, and the moon. Even that simple three object system with this seemingly simple looking force law from the 17th century, you can't write down an exact solution. So what you have to do is go to simulation. Moreover, the ideas of simulation that we're going to be discussing in this video and throughout this class are being used more and more in essentially all fields of science to solve complex problems. In the fall 2015 semester, one of the SIs for Physics 131 was using these same ideas to solve problems in his life science-based senior honors thesis as an undergraduate. So hopefully this impresses upon you the relevance of this technique to all fields of science and medicine in the modern day. So, all right, simulation's important. What's the philosophy, the premise behind the idea of simulation? Well, this is perhaps best done in the context of an example. So let's say we have a runner. There's my runner, okay, I can't draw and they're running. Well, if we want to model the motion of the runner, we would think about the average velocity and how that's related to his position and the change in time, as discussed in many of the other preparatory materials for this unit. Okay, so far so good. Now here is where the idea of simulation comes. If we imagine a really small amount of time, then this runner's velocity from, say, the red instant to the green instant does not change very much. We're going to say that these two things are, you know, super close together. If we make our time interval small enough, then the velocity essentially doesn't change from red to green. It's essentially constant. So if that's true, then the average velocity, which I've written this way this time, you will see me write it both this way and this way. I'm using inconsistent notation because the scientific world uses inconsistent notation, so it's important for you to have seen both. Both of these mean average. If the time is really, really small, then the speed is essentially constant and we can replace average velocity with just his velocity. So say at red, I don't know, he's 
running at five meters per second and at green he's running at 5.001 meters per second I mean honestly close enough they're both essentially five and we can just replace the average of these two numbers is going to be essentially five now we're going to do a little bit of algebra I try to avoid derivations but in this case bear with me for a line we will multiply dt to the other side and bring over the initial position of the runner. So to give you the color codes, this is his initial position, the red at time red. We're assuming that the speed is essentially constant, so we can use the red speed. And this is where he is at the end of this time interval. In other words, if we know where I am now and my speed now, and I'm free to assume that my speed won't change because I'm considering a very, very, very tiny time interval, then I can use that information to predict where I'm going to be in the future. This is the idea of simulation. I use what I know about the system at any given instant to predict how things are going to be in the next small time, a little bit of time later, so from red to green. So this is your big idea. The same philosophy holds true for acceleration. I could have repeated the entire series of steps with acceleration. So if I'm looking at a very small time interval now, so let's start with the definition of acceleration. That's delta V over delta T. And if I'm thinking about a very small time interval, then the average acceleration is going to be the acceleration. The acceleration is not going to change very much as long as this delta t is really, really small. So now I'm just going to have acceleration is delta v over delta t. Do a little bit of algebra. A times delta t is delta v. Delta v is v final minus v initial, so that's going to be a delta t, and v final is v initial plus a delta t. So again, if I know my speed at some instant, my acceleration at some instant, and my delta t is small enough, then I can use that information to predict what my delta V is going to be some small time later. So it's the same idea. We'll be doing this throughout the course with a wide variety of concepts from forces to temperature to entropy. We'll be using it quite a bit. In all cases, you're using what you know now to predict what will happen a small time later 